afternoon to you. I appreciate uh, being reminded of the importance of God's Word just then. And we want to look at it uh, with one another. It looks like we're going to start the session without a big squeak and scratchy noise. So. <laughs> and I have to see how I get this uh, iPad here to work that Matthew has set up for me. So let me Oh, I got a show. I think I need to push show. It's up there. Okay. Well, um, I was asked to, as I said this morning, to speak on preaching, and then on worship, and uh, there was basically the guidance to speak about the importance of worship, which is, of course, uh, an important thing. But when you start talking about the topic of worship, there could be all kinds of ways this could be approached. And so um, what I wanted to do during this time is instead of focusing on things that might divide us, uh, to focus on things that would really unite us because uh, Pastor Lowry and uh, Pastor Heaney wanted us to be reinvigorated and encouraged in the issue of uh, worship. And uh, there are certainly, in our generation, what have been called the worship wars, a lot of different viewpoints on worship and those types of things. Um, but one of the things I like to remind people, and I do at the seminary teach on uh, a class on worship, is that uh, um, really worship itself is a war. That we as God's people are drawing away from the world and we're coming before our king, who we spoke of this morning, and we are getting our marching orders for how to live in this world for his kingdom and for his glory and for his sake. And the greatest battles we should really be thinking about when it comes to worship and the worship wars or the wars of our own souls, um, you know, that battle against the, the sin and the flesh and the devil and learning how to put that to death. So as I start this uh, today, let me overview uh, how we're going to go. Um, I want to give you, I've already given just a touch of a warning, I'm going to give you a little further warning here as we, be, we begin. And then I just want to remind us of the God that we are called to worship, and who he is, and how he's revealed himself uh, to us. And then I want to think about this in terms of, when I'm talking about worship in this setting today, uh, with uh, it being the chief duty of the church, I'm thinking about corporate worship. So that's what this is uh, focusing on, our gathering together as God's people. And so I want to give a definition of that. And then I want us to look at particularly a, a verse in Hebrews chapter 8 that I think is very instructive with respect to worship. Just a way of reminding us uh, that God has set a pattern that all of us are to follow uh, in worship. And then I want to talk a little bit about the seriousness of New Testament worship. I think in our day and age, uh, people think that uh, whether I show up to church or not, or how I worship, or how I view things isn't all that serious. I want to try to um, impress you with how serious New Testament worship is. Um, some of us here in the Reformed uh, churches uh, sometimes talk about the regulative principle. I'll mention what that is. Um, but I want to talk about something I call the other regulative principle. I think so often we're thinking about worship, and we're thinking about just the elements of worship. We're not thinking about what worship is to be doing in us and through us as the people of God. And so I want to uh, end really with that, and that will take us into some applications. So uh, a lot to do. And, uh, uh, I, gotta, I want to aim to end at quarter till two to keep to the schedule. I think we can do that, but i got to keep rolling here. Um, I feel the need to pray, but let me, let me just pray before we start. Heavenly Father, we thank you that through the shed blood of your own Son, you have made a way for us as sinners through faith in him to come into your presence as your Spirit guides us and leads us. And as we've a thought here as we heard the music about the importance of your word, uh, we pray, Father, that your spirit would be pleased to use your word in our lives, even now, so that as we think about uh, gathering in the 
houses of God uh, tomorrow to worship you, that our hearts uh, would long to do that, that you'd even be using this time and this day to prepare us uh, for that. And Father, that you would keep opening our eyes further uh, to who you are and how it is that you want us to be approaching you and spending time with you as your people. Hear our prayers, O oh Father, for I ask it in Christ. Amen. Well, I want to start off um, by giving you what I'm going to call uh, two warnings. And uh, Matthew, I'm not quite sure how to create the animation on this. Do I push it again? Or? The arrows at so, the bottom. So if I say next, it'll yeah. draw something up. Oh, there we go. Thank you. So um, I wanted to give, start this off with just two warnings. Uh, so often in Reformed churches, when the whole issue of worship comes up, we get so focused on what I might say is the application of the second commandment that we neglect the first one. What do I mean? Well, the Ten Commandments start off with, you, you shall have no other God before me. That's the first commandment. That's who we're to worship. The second commandment then talks about idolatry, that you're not to make before God any idols, any false images. And that really has more to do with how we worship. It's stated in the negative, but like some of the other commandments, like you shall not murder, that second commandment's also instructing us on how we should worship. We're not to come to God with our own imaginations as men. That's idolatry. When we bring before God our own thoughts and ways of doing things. You know, we're to come to God as he's instructed us uh, to do so. But what I find is that we start getting into all these discussions about worship, and we can often forget that the first commandment is the first commandment, is that we're coming before God. And we need to remember who God is, this God that has called us to worship. So we're going to talk here for just a little bit few moments about the fact that he's the Trinity. Secondly, I find another thing that can often happen is that we can separate the first great commandment from the second one. You remember Jesus gave a summation of the law in Matthew when he was asked, what are the great commandments? And he says, well, the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he says, there's another one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Are we really worshiping God? When we start talking about worship and then we immediately start talking, attacking the positions of other people or, or come at it in a mean spirit, even if we have points of disagreement, I think not. And, and notice that Jesus said, the first great commandment is to love God. And then he says, a second one is like it. To love your neighbor as yourself. John puts this together for us in his epistle when he reminds us that you cannot say that you uh, love the God you cannot see if you do not show love to the brothers that you can see right there in your midst. And so, in other words, if our worship if our worship isn't leading us as we come before this triune God to care more deeply and to love more profoundly and to grow in grace more and more in the graciousness by which we treat others, then we're not really worshiping Him if we become mean-spirited in the process. And that's, that is the, the way a lot of people review a reform people with respect to, to worship. They just have a fight to pick with you. I, I don't know about your quarters, but certainly the ones that I, uh, well, and that can often be the case of what people think. In other words, if you see one of us coming at you, there's going to be an argument about singing psalms. And uh, as much as I love uh, singing the psalms and represent that uh, uh, the practice in the church, we've got to be very careful if we're talking about worship to do it in a right heart and in a right manner. So the reason for that is because of this God that we are called to worship. And I want to just remind you of how God has revealed himself to us in the scriptures. Who is God? 
God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what we mean by the Trinity. Three and one. One God existing eternally in three persons. And the Bible starts and ends with this revelation. It progresses in it as it goes through the scriptures. But this God is the God that we worship. And again, if you look at uh, uh, the, the church fathers, uh, uh, Augustine and others, if you look at the reformers, some of which, uh, some of whom we talked about today, such as Calvin and John Owen, whenever they were treating the subject of God, they began really with God as triune. And it's been interesting, um, in his book on the Trinity, Robert Lethem points out that that's the way that the reformers often treated God as Trinity. But in more modern theological books, we often start off with other things, such as maybe God's attributes. He points out that in uh, Hodge's uh, systematic theology, he has 250 pages regarding God's attributes before he ever gets to the idea that God is Trinity. And uh, I don't think that we should begin that way, as much as I love Hodge's book, God is Triune. And the Bible really starts off uh, that way. And I'll, I'll mention that. But let me give you one other quote from John Owen, Communion with God. John, in his first epistle, tells us in general what communion with God is. He assures Christian that the fellowship of believers is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And he reminds us of that in his epistle. And so Owen says, if we're going to talk about worshiping God or having fellowship with God, then we need to think about that fellowship with the Father and Son through the Holy Spirit. And he actually, in his book, Communion with God, treats communion with God by looking at it in a triune way. <clears throat> and uh, I could go on, but I just want to remind you of how our Bible is shaped. Here I say the scripture's progressive Trinitarian revelation. You know, it's a trivia question you can ask someone sometime, but uh, where is the Trinity first found in the Bible? I think it's found in the first three verses of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We have God, God the Father mentioned. Second verse, the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the earth. The third verse, and then God said the word of God, let there be light. And we know that word is Jesus Christ. A little bit later, of course, in that chapter, when it comes to making us, making us in God's image, remember how God said it, let us make man in our image. And we see the, the Trinity reflecting together on how you and I were to be made. And the Bible is just filled with Trinity. Yes, we see it clearly in the New Testament. Um, um, Sinclair Ferguson, speaking about John 14 through 17, he says, isn't it interesting that when Jesus was getting ready to go to Calvary's cross, when he knew he was going to be leaving his disciples behind, that what he spends the majority of his time teaching them and instructing them is on the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, their relationship and praying for them uh, in that time. And he's thinking there, of course, of the high priestly prayer. And the Bible's filled with Trinity. You know, a lot of times we think it's just in the New Testament that we come across the Trinity. But in the Old Testament, there's so much imagery. Remember, Jesus said all that was... All that is found in Moses and the prophets spoke of him, Luke 24, 27. He said, you know, everything that's written in the, the law and the prophets and the Psalms about him had to be fulfilled, Luke 20, uh, 24, 44. Everything in the Old Testament, he says, was about him. It led David Murray to write a, a nice little book with a great title, Jesus on Every Page. Jesus is on every page of the scriptures. And if we uh, come to understand the scriptures properly, we have a proper uh, hermeneutic or a proper way of studying the scriptures, we're going to see <coughs> Jesus everywhere we look in the scriptures. 
And along with Jesus, we see, of course, the Father and the Son, uh, and the Father and the Spirit as well. You know, we might think, well, the Holy Spirit's not really that present in the Old Testament. He kind of shows up at Pentecost, Acts 2, right? Well, yeah, the full manifestation of the Spirit comes in Acts 2, but as I just said, he's there in Genesis 1 and 2, and 400 times the Holy Spirit is referenced in the Old Testament. 400 times the Spirit of God is spoken of in the Old Testament. And so if we're going to be thinking about worship, then we need to really be thinking about this triune God that we're coming before as we worship. We come to the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit who dwells in the church, which is called His Holy Temple several times in the New Testament. That leads us to some thoughts and conclusions then that I'd like to get you to think about. I want you to just think with me a little bit here, this is just immediate application really, about the multifaceted, united love radiating from the Trinity's essence. You know, the Bible tells us that God is love. Question for you, is that an attribute or is that of God's essence? In other words, is that saying to us, God is a God who possesses love? Or is it saying to us, God is a God who is love? Well, I think it's the latter. It says it that way. God is love. Well, in order for someone to be essentially love, it would mean they would have to have someone to love within themselves. And that's what we have in the Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit dwelling eternally together in a love of and for one another. Think about Allah, the God of Islam. Have you ever wondered why it's such a harsh religion when properly followed? It's because Allah in a monotheistic system, didn't, what was Allah doing before he created us? He didn't have anyone to love. But God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have loved one another eternally. And actually, that's what Jesus prays in John 17. He prays for us to know and enter into and experience that love. But he says... Father, let them know the love that you've had for me for the creation of the world. He wants us to know that love. And so we should just marvel over who God is. And that really means then that God created this world, not because he needed someone to love, but because he wanted to express his love in this creation that Puritan Richard Sibbs put it this way, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost were happy in themselves, enjoyed one another before the world was, apart from the fact that God delights to communicate and spread his goodness, there would have never been a creation or redemption. He loves to love, and so he created us so that we could enter into this love that they share with one another. And so that means then, as this world has been created and fallen away from its creator, that for God to redeem <coughs> sinful creation, sinful men and women and children back to himself, means that that must be the greatest expression of love, which he says it is. Jesus said it, right? Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends, John 15. He has shown us the greatest love is to be willing to offer yourself for someone that you care for. And that should not only define Jesus, but as we talked about in the first session, if we're preaching the gospel, 
that gospel is impacting the people, it's marking the people to whom are hearing that gospel. And what worship really is, is reflecting the God that we're worshiping. Then that means that, that those who are Christians should be marked by the gospel, not just talk about the gospel to other people, but have their lives marked by the gospel and how they're living before those people. That they're willing to sacrifice, give, even their life if called upon for the sake of the one that they've been called to worship. You know, one of the things I like to think about is that great commandment. You know, why does God tell us to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength? Well, it's because that's the way he's loved us. Giving us his very son, his very essence. He loved you and he loved me with all his heart, all his strength, all his being. He has loved you. He calls you in worship back to loving him in that same way. He did not hold anything back for you in giving you Jesus. And so in worship, he's saying, don't hold anything back from me. Bring it all to me. Bring it all to me. And then one final thing I'll say about this part regarding the Trinity and our worship is that Jonathan Edwards pictured heaven as a, as a world of love. And that what we're really doing when we worship is that we are preparing ourselves further for living there. It's so easy, isn't it, in this world, to think about the here and the now. But biblical worship should be getting us to think about where we're going and where we are heading. We should be thinking about that I'm getting ready to spend eternity with that triune God. And the worship I'm doing here on earth is preparing me, is preparing us together for living in that holy communion one day, eternally and forever. Matter of fact, one of the early church fathers, Gregory of Nazianza, said his pastoral work, that's how he approached the pastor. He says, my job is to get my people heaven ready. I found that very helpful. I, I wish I'd read it earlier in my ministry, <laughs> but I'm sharing it with you. He said, my job, these people that God's given me to tend are on a journey toward heaven, and I'm along this path while, I, while I'm journeying with them. My job is to get them heaven ready, to enter into that world of love. I love to think of the Lord's Day this way. You know, we worship on the Lord's Day, the day of the resurrection, the first day of the week. And what's coming one day? What's coming when Jesus comes back? What is it? That's the great day of the Lord. So every, every Sunday, every Lord's Day, I'm taking a step closer with my congregation than the last week. We've taken one week's <coughs> worth of a step closer to that great meeting when I'm going to be standing there before Jesus. And so as I worship Him, I need to be preparing myself and preparing the people of God to spend eternity before Him. That's why we examine ourselves as we worship, as we reflect upon our own lives, our souls, our sins, and we, we bring them to Jesus, and we, we work at sanctifying ourselves because we know we're getting more and more ready. Moving, as Paul said, from one image to the next, from one glory to the next, as more and more as I worship this God, myself made in His image, and to be reflecting Him more in how I'm living and following Him as we worship. So, that's the first main lesson of this talk is that we're here to 
worship this triune God wholeheartedly and in his love. And so let me then define, try to give you what I would give as a definition of what corporate worship is. And I'm not trying to say this is the definitive um, uh, definition of corporate worship, but it's one I work with, with uh, students as I teach on worship. So I've tried to think through uh, in about a paragraph how to express what I think we should be doing as we come before God in worship. Corporate worship is the church's reverent enjoyment and service to God as regulated by His Word in the love of the Father through the mediation of the Son by the indwelling power of the Spirit. So you see the Trinity reflected there. And we are called corporately as God's people to gather together on the Lord's Day. It's the fourth commandment. But that doesn't mean we can only worship on the Lord's Day. We can do it in other appointed times. And what's to happen there? We're to be strengthened or sanctified by God. And then, as we're going to talk about, it should have a result in our life. We should be learning how more and more to love one another, to fulfill that second great commandment. To evangelize the nations as we're sitting there remembering and thinking about how God has saved us and we know he has a plan to redeem the nations of this earth. The gospel is to go to every tribe, tongue, and nation. We should be preparing to be doing that evangelism. And the God that we worship is especially concerned about the lowly, and so we should be engaging the needy as we prepare for the consummation of his kingdom. Again, this is a working definition. I'm not saying it's definitive. But that's what I want to reflect to you a little bit more as we go on. And I can make these slides available. So uh, I see some of you writing. I probably can't get all that down. Uh, the slides will be available. We have a way of doing that, don't we, Jim? I'll, can I'll we get email them? them? I'll get them on the website uh, along with the yep. videos. Great. Great, thank you. Matthew's the man today. Well, with these things in mind, I want you to open your Bibles up now to Hebrews chapter 8. If you're familiar at all with the book of Hebrews, then I think we could all agree with this statement. One of the great themes in the book of Hebrews is the author is looking back at the Old Testament, be it figures or ways of the Old Testament, and he's saying to them, those were shadows, something greater has come. All of those things in the Old Testament that you might put your hope in, particularly as a, as a book to the Jewish believers, that you might be putting your hope in, was just a, was important. Moses, yes, Moses was important, or the priesthood was important. But what that was pointing to has now come and you have in Jesus Christ. And that comes out here in chapter 8 as well. As you see verse 1, I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, but it's really verse 5 I want us to focus on here for a while. So let me read this to you. Now the point, so it's like, you know, I've been teaching it for seven chapters now. Here, here's what I'm trying to get to. Here it is. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. I want these earthly priests that die and just offer up animal sacrifice. We have, we have Christ, the great priest, all that pointed to, who offered up not animals, but himself. He's saying, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law, but they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern 
that was shown you on the mountain. That's the verse I want us to think about. That when God was working with Moses and Israel out in the wilderness, there at Mount Sinai, giving them that tabernacle, God says here, it, the, the, is commenting on that, and he said, what I want you to understand, he gives three words to describe it. What Moses was doing was giving you a copy, he was giving you a shadow, he was giving you a pattern of what? He says here, of heavenly things. Of heavenly things. In other words, I'm to look at the tabernacle like a, like a big children's sermon. It's an object lesson. It's a pattern of what you now have as a heavenly reality as you worship God, <clears throat> your great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's so important for us to understand. That God has set a pattern for worship since the Old Testament. And the New Testament is the fulfillment of that pattern that he has set for us. Well, how does that work itself out? Well, think about what the tabernacle was. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble. There we go. Think about what the tabernacle was. You recall that God had this, this uh, tent-like structure built by Moses and the people. And in that tent-like structure, it had an outer courtyard with animal skins. And then inside, there was an altar that you would see right as you walked in the front door, pointing to the east. You know, God had sent them out of the Garden of Eden to the east, and now he's going to redeem them by bringing them from the east. east. And right there in the tabernacle is this altar. Uh, we'll talk about this more, but it's, it's, it's by sacrifice, it's by blood that you come into my presence. There was the laver, and then there was the, the, temp, the tabernacle structure itself with the holy place and the holy of holies there. And you remember that when they built it and offered the right sacrifices and got everything instituted, God's glory came and, and, and dwelt there. And you recall how God had the people all around that structure. The priests were immediately camping around it, and then on every side, each direction, were three of the tribes of Israel. And there was a message just in that imagery. The holy God wants to dwell in your midst, but your sin prevents you from coming into his immediate presence. That's why there was a you know, the fence all around the tabernacle. But there is a way to come. Because out, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. But if blood is shed, you can come into my presence. Here's the holy God saying to his people, I want Well, um, I was asked to, as I said this morning, to speak on preaching and then on worship. And uh, there was basically the guidance to speak about the importance of worship, which is, of course, uh, an important thing. But when you start talking about the topic of worship, there could be all kinds of ways this could be approached. And so um, what I wanted to do during this time, instead of focusing on things that might divide us, uh, to focus on things that would really unite us because uh, Pastor Lowry and uh, Pastor Haney uh, wanted us to be um, reinvigorated and encouraged in the issue of uh, worship. And uh, there are certainly in our generation what have been called the worship wars, a lot of different viewpoints on worship and those types of things. Um, one of the things I like to remind people, and I do at the seminary teach on uh, a class on worship, is that uh, um, really worship itself is a war. That we as God's people are drawn away from the world and we're coming before our king, who we spoke of this morning, 
and we are getting our marching orders for how to live in this world for his kingdom and for his glory and for his sake. And the greatest battles we should really be thinking about when it comes to worship, worship wars or the wars of our own souls, um, you know, that battle against the, the sin and the flesh and the devil and learning how to put that to death. So as I start this uh, today, let me overview uh, how we're going to go. Um, I want to give you, I'm going to give just a touch of a warning, give you a little further warning here as we, be, we begin. And then I just want to remind us of the God that we are called to worship, and who he is and how he's revealed himself uh, to us. And then I want to think about this in terms of when I'm talking about worship in this setting today, uh, with uh, it being the chief duty of the church, I'm thinking about corporate worship. So that's what this is uh, focusing on, our gathering together as God's people. And so I want to give a definition of that. And then I want us to look at particularly uh, a verse in Hebrews chapter 8 that I think is very instructive with respect to worship. Just a way of reminding us uh, that God has set a pattern that all of us are to follow uh, in worship. And then I want to talk a little bit about the seriousness of New Testament worship. I think in our day and age, uh, people think that uh, whether I show up to church or not, or how I worship, or how I view things isn't all that serious. I want to try to um, impress you with how serious New Testament worship is. Um, some of us here in the Reformed churches uh, sometimes talk about the regulative principle. I'll mention what that is. Um, but I want to talk about something I call the other regulative principle. I think so often we're thinking about worship, and we're thinking about just the elements of worship. We're not thinking about what worship is to be doing in us and through us as the people of God. And so I want to uh, end really with that, and that will take us into some applications. So uh, a lot to do, and uh, I got I want to aim to end at quarter till two to keep to the schedule. I think we can do that, but I got to keep rolling. Um, I feel the need to pray, though. Let me let me just pray before we start. Heavenly Father, we thank you that through the shed blood of your own Son, you have made a way for us as sinners through faith in him to come into your presence as your spirit guides us and leads us. And as we've thought here, as we heard the music about the importance of your word, uh, we pray, Father, that your spirit would be pleased to use your word in our lives even now so that as we think about uh, gathering in the houses of God uh, tomorrow to worship you, that our hearts would long to do that, that you'd even be using this time and this day to prepare us for that. And Father, that you would keep opening our eyes further into who you are and how it is that you want us to be approaching you and spending time with you as your people. Hear our prayers, O oh Father, for I ask it in Christ. Amen. Well, I want to start off um, by giving you what I might call uh, two warnings. And uh, Matthew, I'm not quite sure how to create the animation on this. Do I push it again? Or? The arrows. So, so if I say next, it'll draw something up. Oh, there we go. Thank you. So um, I want to give, start this off with just two warnings. Uh, so often in Reformed churches, when the whole issue of worship comes up, we get so focused on what I might say is the application of the second commandment that we neglect the first one. What do I mean? Well, the Ten Commandments start off with, you shall have no other God before me. That's the first commandment. That's who we're to worship. The second commandment then talks about idolatry, that you're not to make before God any idols, any false images. And that really has more to do with how we worship. It's stated in the negative, but like some of the other commandments, like you shall not murder, that second commandment is also instructing us on how we should worship. We're not to come to God with our own imaginations as men. That's idolatry. When we bring before God our own thoughts and ways of doing things, no, we're to come to God as he's instructed us uh, to do so. 
But what I find is that we start getting into all these discussions about worship, and we can often forget that the first commandment is the first commandment, is that we're coming before God. And we need to remember who God is, this God that has called us to worship. So we're going to talk here for just a little bit, a few moments, about the fact that he's the Trinity. Secondly, I find another thing that can often happen is that we can separate the first great commandment from the second one. You remember Jesus gave a summation of the law in Matthew when he was asked, what are the great commandments? And he says, well, the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he said, there's another one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Are we really worshiping God? When we start talking about worship and then we immediately start talk, attacking the positions of other people or come at it in a mean spirit, even if we have points of disagreement, I think not. And, and notice that Jesus said, the first great commandment is to love God. And then he says, the second one is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. John puts this together for us in his epistle. And he reminds us that you cannot say that you uh, love the God you cannot see if you do not show love to the brothers that you can see right there in your midst. And so, in other words, if our worship, if our worship isn't leading us as we come before this triune God to care more deeply and to love more profoundly and to grow in grace more and more in the graciousness by which we treat others, then we're not really worshiping him if we become mean-spirited in the process. And that's, that is the, the way a lot of people review uh, reform people when, with respect to, to worship. They just have a fight to pick with you. I, I don't know about your quarters, but certainly in the ones that I, uh, well, and that can often be the case of what people think. In other words, if you see one of us coming at you, there's going to be an argument about singing psalms. And as much as I love uh, singing the psalms and represent that uh, uh, practice in the church, we've got to be very careful if we're talking about worship to do it in a right heart and in a right manner. So the reason for that is because of this God that we are called to worship. And I want to just remind you of how God has revealed himself to us in the scriptures. Who is God? God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what we mean by the Trinity. Three in one. One God existing eternally in three persons. And the Bible starts and ends with this revelation. It progresses in it as it goes through the scriptures. But this God is the God that we worship. And again, if you look at uh, uh, the, the church fathers, uh, uh, Augustine and others, if you look at the reformers, some of which, uh, some of whom we talked about today, such as Calvin and John Owen, whenever they were treating the subject of God, they began really with God as triune. And it's been interesting, um, in his book on the Trinity, Robert Latham points out but that's the way that the reformers often treated God as Trinity. But in more modern theological books, we often start off with other things, such as maybe God's attributes. He points out that in the Hodges of Systematic Theology, he has 250 pages regarding God's attributes before he ever gets to the idea that God is Trinity. And I don't think that we should begin that way, as much as I love Hodges' book. God is triune. And the Bible really starts off uh, that way. And I'll, I'll mention that, but let me give you one other quote from John Owen, Communion with God. John, in his first epistle, tells us in general what communion with God is. He assures Christian that the fellowship of believers is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And he reminds us of that in his epistle. And so Owen says, if we're going to talk about worshiping God or having fellowship with God, 
And we need to think about that fellowship of the Father and Son through the Holy Spirit. And he actually, in his book, Communion with God, and treats communion with God by looking at it in a trying way. <coughs> and uh, I could go on, but I just want to remind you of how our Bible is shaped. Uh, here I say the Scripture's progressive Trinitarian revelation. You know, it's a trivia question you can ask someone sometime, but uh, where is the Trinity first found in the Bible? I think it's found in the first three verses of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We have God, or God the Father mentioned. The second verse, the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the earth. The third verse, and then God said, the word of God. Let there be light. And we know that word is Jesus Christ. A little bit later, of course, in that chapter, when it comes to making us, making us in God's image, remember how God said it, let us make man in our image. And we see the, the Trinity reflecting together on how you and I were to be made. And the Bible is just filled with Trinity. Yes, we see it clearly in the New Testament. Um, Sinclair Ferguson, speaking about John 14 through 17, he says, isn't it interesting that when Jesus was getting ready to go to Calvary's cross, when he knew he was going to be leaving his disciples behind, that what he spends the majority of his time <coughs> teaching them and instructing them is on the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, their relationship and praying with them uh, in that time. And he's thinking of there, of course, of the high priestly prayer. And the Bible's filled with Trinity. You know, a lot of times we think it's just in the New Testament that we come across the Trinity. But in the Old Testament, there's so much imagery. Remember, Jesus said all that was. All that's found in Moses and the prophets spoke of him, Luke 24, 27. He said, you know, everything that's written in the, the law and the prophets and the Psalms about him had to be fulfilled, Luke 20, uh, 24, 44. Everything in the Old Testament, he says, was about him. It led David Murray to write a, a nice little book with a great title, Jesus on Every Page. Jesus is on every page of the scriptures. And if we uh, come to understand the scriptures properly, we have a proper uh, hermeneutic or a proper way of studying the scriptures, we're going to see Jesus everywhere we look in the scriptures. And along with Jesus, we see, of course, the Father and the Son, uh, and the Father and the Spirit as well. You know, we might think, well, the Holy Spirit's not really that present in the Old Testament. <coughs> He kind of shows up at Pentecost, Acts 2, right? Well, yeah, the full manifestation of the Spirit comes in Acts 2. But as I just said, he's there in Genesis 1 and 2. And 400 times the Holy Spirit is referenced in the Old Testament. 400 times the Spirit of God is spoken of in the Old Testament. And so if we're going to be thinking about worship, then we need to really be thinking about this triune God that we're coming before as we worship. We come to the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit who dwells in the church which is called His Holy Temple several times in the New Testament. That leads us to some thoughts and conclusions then that I'd like to get you to think about. I want you to just think with me a little bit here. This is just immediate application, really, about the multifaceted, united love radiating from the Trinity's essence. You know, the Bible tells us that God is love. Question for you, is that an attribute or is that of God's essence? In other words, is that saying to us, God is is a God who possesses love? Or is it saying to us, God is a God who is love? Well, I think it's the latter. It says it that way. God is love. Well, in order for someone to be essentially 
love. It mean they would have to have someone to love within themselves. And that's what we have in the Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit dwelling eternally together in a love of and for one another. Think about Allah, the God of Islam. You ever wondered why it's such a harsh religion when properly followed? It's because Allah, in a monotheistic system, didn't, what was Allah doing before he created us? He didn't have anyone to love. But God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have loved one another eternally. And actually, that's what Jesus prays in John 17. He prays for us to know and enter into and experience that love he says, Father, let them know the love that you've had for me before the creation of the world. He wants us to know that love. And so we should just marvel over who God is. And that really means then that God created this world not because he needed someone to love, but because he wanted to express his love in this creation that Puritan Richard Sibbs put it this way, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost were happy in themselves, enjoyed one another before the world was, apart from the fact that God delights to communicate and spread His goodness, there would have never been a creation or redemption. He loves to love, and so He created us so that we could enter into this love that they share with one another. And so that means then as this world has been created and fallen away from its creator, that for God to redeem <coughs> sinful creation, sinful men and women and children back to himself, means that that must be the greatest expression of love, which he says it is. Jesus said it, right? Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. John 13. He has shown us the greatest love is to be willing to offer yourself for someone that you care for. And that should not only define Jesus, but as we talked about in the first session, if we're preaching the gospel, and that gospel is impacting the people, it's marking the people to whom are hearing that gospel. And what worship really is, is reflecting the God that we're worshiping. And that means then that, that those who are Christians should be marked by the gospel, not just talk about the gospel to other people, but have their lives marked by the gospel and how they're living before those people that they're willing to sacrifice, give, even their life if called upon for the sake of the one that they've been called to worship. You know, one of the things I like to think about is that great commandment. You know, why does God tell us to love Him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength? Well, because that's the way he's loved us. Giving us his very son, his very essence. He loved you and he loved me with all of his heart, with all of his strength, with all of his being. He has loved you. And he calls you in worship back to loving him in that same way. He did not hold anything back for you in giving you Jesus. And so in worship, he's saying, don't hold anything back from me. Bring it all to me. Bring it all to me. And then one final thing I'll say about this part regarding the Trinity and our worship. 
is that Jonathan Edwards pictured heaven as a, as a world of love. And that what we're really doing when we worship is that we are preparing ourselves further for living there. It's so easy, isn't it, in this world to think about the here and the now. But biblical worship should be getting us to think about where we're going and where we are heading. We should be thinking about that I'm getting ready to spend eternity with that triune God. And the worship I'm doing here on earth is preparing me, is preparing us together for living in that holy communion one day, eternally, and forever. Matter of fact, one of the early church fathers, Gregory of Nazianzus, in his pastoral work, that's how he approached the pastor. He says, my job is to get my people heaven ready. And I found that very helpful. I, I, I wish I'd read it earlier in my ministry, <laughs> but I'm sharing it with you. He said, my job, these people that God's given me to tend are on a journey toward heaven. And I'm along this path while, I, while I'm journeying with them. My job is to get them heaven ready, to enter into that world of love. I love to think of the Lord's Day this way. You know, we worship on the Lord's Day, the day of the resurrection, the first day of the week. And what's coming one day? What's coming when Jesus comes back? What is it? That's the great day of the Lord. So every, every Sunday, every Lord's Day, I'm taking a step closer with my congregation than the last week. We've taken one week's worth of a step closer to that great meeting when I'm going to be standing there before Jesus. And so as I worship Him, I need to be preparing myself and preparing the people of God to spend eternity with Him. That's why we examine ourselves as we worship, as we reflect upon our own lives, our souls, our sins, and we, we bring them to Jesus, and we, we work at sanctifying ourselves because we know we're getting more and more ready. Moving, as Paul said, from one image to the next, from one glory to the next, as more and more as I worship this God, myself made in His image, and to be reflecting Him more in how I'm living and following Him as we worship. So, that's the first main lesson of this talk is that we are here to worship this triune God wholeheartedly and in His love. And so let me then define, try to give you what I would give as a definition of what corporate worship is. And I'm not trying to say this is the definitive um, uh, definition of corporate worship, but it's one I work with with uh, students as I teach on worship. I try to think through uh, in about a paragraph how to express what I think we should be doing as we come before God in worship. Corporate worship is the church's reverent enjoyment and service to God as regulated by His Word in the love of the Father through the mediation of the Son by the indwelling power of the Spirit. So you see the Trinity reflected there. And we are called corporately as God's people to gather together on the Lord's Day. It's the fourth commandment. But that doesn't mean we can only worship on the Lord's Day. We can do it in other appointed times. And what's to happen there? We're to be strengthened or sanctified by God. And then, as we're going to talk about, it should have a result in our life. We should be learning how more and more to love one another, to fulfill that second great commandment. To evangelize the nations as we're sitting there remembering and thinking about how God has saved us and we know He has a plan to redeem the nations of this earth. The gospel is to go to every tribe, tongue, and nation. We should be preparing to be doing that evangelism. And the God that we worship is especially concerned about the lowly, and so we should be engaging the needy 
as we prepare for the consummation of his kingdom. Again, this is a working definition. I'm not saying it's definitive, but that's what I want to reflect to you a little bit more as we go on. And I can make these slides available, so uh, I see some of you writing. If I can get all that down. Uh, the slides will be available. We have a way of doing that, don't we, Jim? I'll, I'll, can we email them? I'll get them on the website. Uh, yep. Great. Great. Thank you. Matthew's the man today. Well, with these things in mind, I want you to open your Bibles up now to Hebrews chapter 8. If you're familiar at all with the book of Hebrews, then I think we could all agree with this statement. One of the great themes of the book of Hebrews is the author is looking back at the Old Testament, be it figures or ways of the Old Testament, and he's saying to them, those were shadows, something greater has come. All of those things in the Old Testament that you might put your hope in, particularly as a, as a book to the Jewish uh, believers, that you might be putting your hope in, was just a was important. Moses, yes, Moses was important, or the priesthood was important. But what that was pointing to has now come, and you have in Jesus Christ. And that comes out here in chapter eight as well. As you see, verse one. I'm going to read verses one through five, but it's really verse five I want us to focus on here for a while. So let me read this to you. Now the point, so it's like, you know, I've been teaching here for seven chapters now. Here, here's what I'm trying to get at. Here it is. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Not only these earthly priests that die and just offer up animals. We have, we have Christ, the great priest, all that pointed to, who offered up not animals, but himself. He's saying, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man, for every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law, they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. That's the verse I want us to think about. That when God was working with Moses, and Israel out in the wilderness, there at Mount Sinai, giving them that tabernacle. God says here, it, the, the, is commenting on that, and he said, what I want you to understand, he gives three words to describe it. What Moses was doing was giving you a copy, he was giving you a shadow, he was giving you a pattern of what? He says here, of heavenly things. Of heavenly things. In other words, I'm to look at the tabernacle like a like a big children's sermon. It's an object lesson. It's a pattern of what you now have as a heavenly reality as you worship God, <coughs> your great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's so important for us to understand. That God has set a pattern for worship since the Old Testament. And the New Testament is the fulfillment of that pattern that he has set for us. Well, how does that work itself out? Well, think about what the tabernacle was. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble. There we go. Think about what the tabernacle was. You recall that God had this... this uh, tent-like structure built by Moses and the people. And in that tent-like structure, it had an outer courtyard, 
of animal skins. And then inside there was an altar that you would see right as you walked in the front door, pointing to the east. You know, God has sent them out of the Garden of Eden to the east, and now He's going to redeem them by bringing them from the east. East and right there in the tabernacle is this altar. We'll talk about this more, but it's, it's it's by sacrifice, it's by blood that you come into my presence. There was the laver, and then there was the the, temp, the tabernacle structure itself, with the holy place and the holy of holies there. And you remember that when they built it and offered the right sacrifices and got everything instituted, God's glory came and, and dwelt there. And you recall how God had the people all around that structure. The priests were immediately camping around it, and then on every side, each direction, were three of the tribes of Israel. And there was a message just in that imagery. The Holy God wants to dwell in your midst, but your sin prevents you from coming into his immediate presence. That's why there was a you know the fence all around the tabernacle. But there is a way to come. Because without, without the shedding of blood there's no forgiveness of sins. But if blood is shed you can come into my presence. Here's the Holy God saying to his people, I want to dwell with you. Your sins would prevent it, but I have provided blood which you may come into my presence. And that was the, the message of the tabernacle. Now, think about this and some of the imagery that's found there in the tabernacle. Just think of all the items in the tabernacle. The tabernacle and the temple itself. Whoa! I'm glad to continue on. Okay? Okay. Okay. So, where we were was uh, there was a table up here. And it'll come up here in just a moment. But in that table, I just want you to think about the different elements of the tabernacle, the tabernacle itself, and what that was to represent to us as God's people. Of course, the tabernacle, the temple, we know, ultimately pictured Jesus for us, right? Because he, we're told in uh, the Gospel of John, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, or as it says in the Greek, literally tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory, glory as of the only from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so ultimately that tabernacle represented Jesus. He stood in the middle of the temple. That was the later more permanent structure. And he said in John chapter 2, destroy this temple. In three days I will raise it. The disciples later came to the awareness that what he meant by that was he was speaking of himself, his own body. He was the true temple. Well, a lot of us know that. <coughs> that the topology of the Old Testament points to Christ. And in this uh, uh, table that will come up here in a minute, um, the middle column is pretty easy to figure out. Because it's just the typical Sunday school answer. You know, you ask a question of the kids and they just say Jesus and they're right. And that's what it is. Everything's pointing to Jesus. But sometimes what I think we as the church forget to remember is how ultimately gracious Jesus is. That what he has as the head of the body, he loves to share with the body of Christ. And so yes, he is the temple, but to mix the metaphors a little bit, he's the chief cornerstone. The apostles are the foundation, and he calls us. As Paul, as Paul said to the church at Corinth, do you not know that you're the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Or as Peter put it in 1 Peter 2, he says, yes, Jesus is the living stone by which men have salvation or if they stumble over him are doomed to perdition. But then he goes on to say, but you also are living stones built up into a spiritual house to offer sacrifices 
to the living God. Isn't that an incredible way to think about the church? I love to think of it as through history, God laid that foundation of Jesus and the apostles with their teaching. That's the foundation of the church. And through the ages, in the first century, second century, <coughs> they've been building stories on top of that church. And now in the 21st century, you and I are those living selves, those jewels in the temple of God, fitted in perfectly, right where God wants us. I love it in Corinthians. It's, it says he puts each member in the body just as he desires. Whether they're the great members of the body or the lesser members of the body, they're all there fitted together as the holy temple of God. The animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, of course, represented Christ and his offering of him, his own self to us. But it's really interesting, Ed. An interesting study to do in the New Testament is to notice how often the life of a believer is described in sacrificial terms. How often the life of a believer in service to God is described in sacrificial terms. Of course, we hear it in places like Romans 12, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies a living and holy sacrifice pleasing to God. The writer to the Hebrews says in chapter 13 that we are to offer to God the praise, the fruit of our lips. Paul in the Romans describes going and bringing the gospel to the Gentiles as offering those Gentiles like first fruits offerings to the Lord. Or in Ephesians, Paul describes prayer uh, as an as a incense being offered up to the Lord. The same picture is given to us in the book of Revelation of the prayers of the saints, Revelation 8 of 5. But the prayers of the saints are rising up and they're met in heaven like incense it says and they're met in heaven with an angel who takes the censer off the altar and he purifies those prayers and then it's pictured as those prayers being hurled back to the earth and there's thunder and earthquake and lightning as God changes the face of history <coughs> through the prayers of his people. And so on and on it goes. The priests, of course, are represented by Christ as our great high priest. But as we talked about this morning, we have all been made priests by the Lord. The man of the showbread, Jesus very clearly in John 6 told us, who the real bread is. I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread of heaven, he said. And yet, as we participate, like in communion with Jesus, and eat of that bread, and he's just showing us vividly by the sacrament of communion, that yes, he's our bread, but he's in us. He dwells within us. And we are to be offering that bread of life to others around us. Or the lampstand in the holy place, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And yet, he doesn't stop there. He goes on to tell us that you are the light of the world as we shine as witnesses to the Lord Jesus Christ. My point is, is that God has given us a pattern that we are to be following as we worship him. And so that leads me then to move in this to even further application to ask you this question. My slides aren't there, so I'll just ask it. I wonder if you were, if I were to ask you, or maybe if you were to ask uh, your average uh, person in the pew, what was more, what's more serious in the Bible? Old Testament worship or New Testament worship? I have a feeling a lot of people would say Old Testament worship. And they would say that because, well, it was so regulated and had all those ceremonies and sacrifices. They had these priests over it. Just way more, way more serious. There are people who, if they didn't do what God said, there were times where people just died, like Uzzah with the ox cart. Or when King Uzziah goes in and tries to play priest, and when he wasn't a priest, he gets struck with uh, leprosy on his forehead. You know why God put it there, right? 
God put that leprosy on his forehead. Remember what the priests wore on their foreheads? Holy to the Lord. God's saying to King Uzziah, unholy, unholy what you have done. And so people look at the Old Testament and say, it's way more serious than the New Testament worship. Well, let's look at some more at Hebrews. Go over to Hebrews chapter 10. Remember, the author of Hebrews <coughs> is in a warning mode. He's warning the people of God who want to go back to these old shadows and ways. Again, it would have been familiar to them to, to worship in the ways that uh, were that they had grown up with as Jewish believers. And now it just all seems so, so simple and easy in some ways. And he's saying, wait a minute, though. Don't, don't wander away from the gospel. Don't turn away from the gospel. And because to turn away from the gospel is a very serious matter. And notice how he expresses that. Now, Hebrews 10, look at verse 19. Here again is our life in Christ explained in the pattern of the Old Testament worship. Listen to all the imagery put before us here. <clears throat> Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, remember the curtain in the holy, the holy places, which was, of course, rent asunder when Jesus died on the cross, <clears throat> representing, it says here, his flesh. Since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. <clears throat> let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And then these familiar verses regarding worship. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. See, worship on the Lord's day is preparing us for the day that's drawing near. Jesus is going to return. Are we ready? Are we ready for him? And then the warning. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a, a fearful expectation of judgment, a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much Worst punishment, do you think, will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has outraged the Spirit of grace? We know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I'll repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Friends, in the Old Testament, when they played around with the things in the temple, they were playing around with types, and shadows, and copies. And that was, that was bad to do because it distorted the picture God had. When people come into the house of God today, They do not worship God as he has prescribed in this pattern, this pattern that he has set. The warning is that we could be falling away, that we could be, as it says here, trampling underfoot the blood of God's Son. And it should not be. I remember as a young man, a young teenager, in my unbelief, sitting in church, making jokes as the communion 
elements that pass by. In essence, mocking the visible gospel that was right there before me. Now, unless God had saved me, redeemed me, that would be one of my greatest shames. I had done some other rotten things before I became a Christian. But to be honest, that's one of the things that I look back upon. I, it just shows me how blind and ignorant I was in Christ. It's a serious matter to come before the living God. Now, he has simplified it greatly in New Testament worship, but that does not make it a serious Simplification does not lead to less seriousness if it's dealing with reality, with the truth of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, I won't take the time at this moment to read through the whole passage, but I think you might be familiar with this. Uh, verses 18 through the end of the chapter where... Uh, the writer to the Hebrews says, you know, we're not coming to Mount Sinai where it had a blazing fire and trumpets and the earth shaking and all of that and the people were fearful there. He says, you're not even coming to that. What you're coming to is to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels, to the assembly of the firstborn, to God, to the spirits made perfect, and to Jesus, the new mediator, whose sprinkled blood speaks a better word than blood. That's the great, the great warning that the book of Hebrews gives us, is that we should have a real reverence as we come before God and worship. Well, there you go. You've got the, you've got the table. It'll be made available to you. I want to talk to you for just a minute, if I may, about what I call the other... Um, hold on here where I find my place. So there's that. And I'll make these we'll make these slides available to you. But I want to I want to talk to you about something I call maybe the other regulative principle of worship. Now, what do I mean by that? It, it's in quotes, okay? <clears throat> I've got it in red there. Well, what's the regulative principle? Reformed Christians, rightly so, believe that there is a biblical principle that helps us regulate our worship. The regulative principle of worship is that as we worship, we must take great care to only do as the Bible. Commands. We're to follow God's word. He's, he's taught sinners how to come to himself. We should pay attention and do that as we come before him and worship. That's the regulative principle. I could have spent the whole time talking about that by creating some arguments here. I chose not to do so. Because on my heart, is again, that great commandment is to love God and to love one another like we ought to do. And what I call the other regulative principle is this, because I don't think we think of this enough, is that there is a principle that insists that our worship is to regulate us. I think I just turned a fan on here. Is to regulate us. That other regulative principle of worship is that as we worship, we must take great care to do for the needy as the Bible commands. I would say over the last uh, 10 years of it, that I was serving in pastoral ministry, I began to get very convicted that as we as God's people were standing before him each Lord's Day, that, that he was examining us and looking for the fruit that we are supposed to be bringing before him. That happened through a variety of ways. It happened as I did sing the Psalms and kept seeing over and over again God's concern as the God of the orphan and the widow that we are to, to take care of the poor and the needy around us. It came just from the practicalities of the ministry and seeing the needs of people around us. 
It came through studying the prophets as they cried out, especially as I preached in the book of Isaiah, as he cried out from the very first chapter to the very last one, that you're coming before me, you're offering what you're supposed to do outwardly, you're bringing all the burnt sacrifices, but it's detestable to me, God would say, because of the way that you're treating the people around you. And in uh, Isaiah 5, he pictures, as he often does in the scriptures, Israel as a, as a vineyard that he had planted, expecting to get good fruit out of it, but instead what he was getting was worthless fruit, rotten fruit. And that's why Jesus came. It's the true vine. So that we could produce the right fruit before God. And then I began to see that this is a very reformed principle. Let me explain how I saw that. I saw that in some of our, in the scriptures, first of all, what does God say? Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is to visit orphans and widows in their distress, to show our faith by our works. We're to be caring for people. That transformed us as a, as a congregation. We began to use the Lord's Day like we saw Jesus doing, caring for people. Not just thinking reform means coming to morning and evening worship and sleeping in between. It's a lot of people's view of what the Sabbath is to be. We, I see in the Matthew 25 that when Jesus comes back on that great day that we're supposed to be preparing for in worship, he's going to judge us. How's he going to judge us? He's going to judge us by whether we were the ones that went and visited the poor and helped the ill and, and fed the hungry and clothed the naked that is the fruits that we are to be bringing forth from a true living faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, Psalm 84 talks about God taking his stand in the congregation to see if his people are doing that, rescuing the weak and the needy. And then I saw, this is really reformed because even the Westminster Directory of Public Worship talks about this. Let me put some references up. When the Lord's Supper is celebrated, there was to be a collection for the poor. That's a tradition in the Reformed churches that's gotten lost in a lot of Reformed churches. Where when they got together and they were thinking most highly upon the sacrifice that their Lord made for them, that they would then in turn think of the, other, the needs of others. Around them. That's a great heritage in the Reformed churches, but I don't see it practiced very often anymore. On the Lord's Day, notice, yes, you should be in the congregation reading and meditating, talking about the sermons, sorry, a catechizing, yes, uh, singing the psalms, all those kinds of things, but then notice, visit the sick, relieve the poor, and such like duties of piety, charity, and mercy, accounting the Sabbath a delight. That's how the Sabbath becomes more delightful. It's by caring for people. <clears throat> and then it talks uh, further down about how special collections should be, be, should be being made for the poor. Well, let's bring this to a close. Some applications here in closing. First of all, as those who have been redeemed, you know, be glad to go to the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said to me, to the Lord's house, let us go, the psalmist said. And uh, what Christ has done for us, what the Father has done in sending his Son and his Spirit into this world to draw us as his elect into the church, and providing a way that we can worship the true God, should be of great delight to us. We should see every worship service as an invitation to come and enjoy that life we have with God. Secondly, all the elements of our worship should be Christ-centered. From the singing, to the call to worship, to the praying, to the reading, to the preaching, we should be intentionally centered on Christ. And to be Christ-centered, is to be a, a true Christ-centeredness as a Trinitarian. Because you can't, as Augustine said, I, I can't think of the one without my mind being drawn to the three, and I can't think of the three without my mind being drawn to the one. And when you think of Christ, you can't 
truly think of Jesus without thinking of his Father and of how his Spirit has come to our lives to help us. And so make your worship Christ-centered. I think in our modern day, we need to restore um, restore reverence and fear. I think it's easy for us this modern consumeristic age where people have all kinds of churches to shop from is that we want to be always the, the nice church, the, the kind church, the, the uh, overlook everything church. Well, and we want to be friendly, we want to be loving, we want to be warm. But we also have the duty as God's people to show reverence in the house of God and to warn people truly over where their sins will take them. And so the worship should have warnings involved in it. God's word is constantly warning us as his people. As I've mentioned before, you might want to think more deliberately, especially if you're leading in worship, to think about preparing, that worship is to be preparing God's people to live not only Monday through Saturday, which is often what you hear, but eternally, eternally with God. Are you doing, as it says in Colossians, <laughs> setting their minds on things above where Christ is seated? And getting them to think about heaven. You know, people sometimes will say, you know, they're too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. I, I, I think it's just the reverse of these days. Right? People are too earthly minded, and they're not really thinking of the goods of heaven. We really need to elevate people's minds to be thinking. That can come through preaching. A great way to think to do it is just through prayer, particularly the pastoral prayer. To have an eternal mindset as we're praying for the people of God. We often in church, isn't it amazing you have a prayer service and you ask for requests? And what's everybody asking for? You know, some of them call them organ recitals, right? As people pray for their relatives that have, you know, this organ in their heart or their kidney or their liver that needs healing. And we're always praying for healing. And, and it's great to pray for healing. But what about praying for them to be ready? Yeah. Ready to go. Ready to be with Jesus. For me to live as Christ. But to die as king. The pastor here just quoted that to me earlier. And then worship should be encouraging love and evangelism. I'm not saying that we do all our evangelism in the worship service, but it should be encouraged that people are, are being prepared to have a heart to love those around them and to share the good news with those that are outside of the, the body of Christ. Um, how can you worship God who reached out in love to you through his son and not have the heart to do that 